Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Hare Krishna Project podcast. This is episode number 122. A big thank you to everyone who uh, continues to tune in on a regular basis from all over the world. Uh, we have a very supportive global audience, and I really appreciate that. Uh, do not forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, if you haven't already, to hit the subscribe button down there. Uh, so you can be kept updated about future podcasts and video productions from the Hare Krishna Project. And if you're watching this on Facebook, which is the other way you can watch this podcast, please also do the same. Um, like or follow the Hare Krishna Project Facebook page so you can be kept updated with what we're doing in that way. As you know, we don't just produce podcasts. We do Hare Krishna festivals, book distribution, public talks, events, lots of things that keep me out of trouble. <laughs> I like to keep busy. Um, as you know, on this podcast, um, I love to interview a range of guests. Um, most of you know that I'm surprised that we went past episode 10 uh, and now we're at episode 122. And I love meeting devotees from around the world. And this week, we are going back to Spain. I love Spain. I haven't been for a while. I drove there once from the UK but uh, and drove back. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our guest this week. It's Krishna Kripa Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Prabhuji, it's great to have you with us. Uh, whenever I think of Spain, I always think of it being very hot, you know, on the Mediterranean. Um, I was in Nice, southern France last year for my uh, brother's wedding. And, and I was thinking, oh, Spain's not far away. I could just hire a car and drive to Spain. But uh, unfortunately, I never made it. Um, but I feel like I'm in Spain talking to you. Um, so. Let's kick off with the first question. Uh, it's the first question that every guest gets just to warm us up. Um, Krishna Kri Prabhu, Prabhu, tell us a little bit about you and where you are from. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in your great uh, Oscars. I really love it, your previous record. I hope that you and the rest of you like it, uh, my small uh, support to you to your podcast. I was born in the 1970 in in Spain. Celpa is a Spanish territory, Spanish city in the north of Africa. We are in the border with Morocco and separated from the Spain mainland about by 30 kilometers in the stretch of Gibraltar. And I was born from an Indian Hindu father and a Christian Catholic mother. So I have the good fortune to grow up in an interfaith, intercultural family. I am the second of uh, four brothers. Two, uh, we are practicing Hindus, and uh, two of my two other are Christians. <laughs> uh, so, well, in, in any case, we have a happy childhood, and the, the good things of being um, born or being part of the uh, interreligious family is that uh, we celebrate uh, Easter and Christmas and Diwali, so we got presents for both sides. Uh, well, my parents uh, taught us uh, or religion, my father, the basic teachings of what is Sanatan Dharma, what is Hinduism, and my father, about Catholic Christianity, and then they let us choose so at the age of 14, when I was 14 years, I came through a book. Uh, it was called Elevation to Krishna Consciousness. It was one of the first books that was translated and printed in Spain. Because before the first uh, books, uh, Shina Prabhupada books translated into Spanish, uh, the translation was done in Mexico or in Los Angeles, California. And well, there is certain difference and expressions between the Spanish from Spain and the Spanish from Latin America, as they say with the English from England and the English from the United States. So, and that book uh, was sitting in the shelf of my father's uh, library that he has. Uh, 
And I took it in 1984. And well, when I read that book, I say, oh, this is what I was looking for. And so I asked my father, how you got this book? And he told me that in 1979, uh, the former former Iskong guru Jayatirtha Prabhu, Jayatirtha Das, he came to Spain, he came to my city uh, with a group of the English devotees, because we have to remember that in those days, Sonada Chavez, the guru from Spain was Bhagavan Das. But uh, Jayatirtha had one very special disciple in my place. So he came and they distributed different books in English and Spanish. So my father bought that book and a record, a long play record called Vrindavan. That still you can find some recordings in the in the internet with songs by uh, Chutananda Swami on the uh, famous kirtans from those days. So I really like it. And uh, well, uh, then my father uh, told me to visit this person, this devotee. Uh, he's a, he was an Indian, Indian, Indian body devotee, and uh, well, he started kind of preaching to me, and uh, well, so I joined ISCO in 1985, after the age of uh, 15, and well, I started reading all the books, and even I self-taught uh, self English, because in the school I was learning as my second language, uh, French. So I can read more books that still were not translated into, into Spanish. And then, uh, well, in 1986, I met uh, Bhagavan Das. Uh, he was the Solana in those days in Spain. And since I was uh, underage in Spain, the, the majority of age is uh, 18 years. So at that time I was 16. So since that was going on, they famous case of Robin George in the court. So now they wanted, they didn't want to take any any chances. So they told me, okay, you should wear till you are 18 or you should have a letter uh, signed by your parents that they have to authorize you to, to take the initiation. No? So in the meantime, well, I tried to convince my parents and everything. So he left <laughs> and he never came back for good or for, or for bad. And, uh, then later on, I followed different gurus. I went to India the first time in 1988, at the age of 17. It was a big uh, impression for me because what I read in the in the books, in the Krishna book and all the things, and then when you saw the the reality of what was India like uh, almost 35 years ago, 37 years ago, it was quite different. I remember I went to Mumbai, those days I still was in Bombay, and when I came out from the airport and I saw so many people, I thought this a strike is going on, protests, mass protests or something was going on, but it was just thousands and thousands of people just doing their normal life, daily life. And then I went to, my first day, I went to the East Coast and to stay there. Visit that there. Of course, I have relatives from my father's side that I, I they, um, I, I was with them in, in their house. But I used to go to the Iskon, to the Iskon temple in Juhu. And the first question they asked me, "Where are you from?" When I say I'm from Spain, so I say, "Where is Bhagavan?" This was in 1988. Say, so I don't know. He, he left. So they were very, because still after a few years later, still there was a lot. Frustration, you, as you say, still 40 years later, still not everybody recovered. No? Those, uh, from those areas, those, those zones were uh, managed by those uh, previous so called uh, 11 acharyas. And then I traveled India so many times, like 28 different times. I spent almost six years in India, in different, uh, if you had the different time that I spent. In Vrindavan, in Mayapur, I traveled all over South India also, and I was learning uh, the ritual. I was always very interested in learning how to do the the fire ceremonies and all the pujas and the rituals. So I learned in different places with uh, different teachers. Uh, finally, I took the initiation from His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami in 1991. 
um, well, uh, when, whenever he used to come to Spain, I used to be his secretary. I used to arrange his travel, his itinerary in Spain. The people wanted to meet him, the programs and everything. I used to do translation for him, from English into Spanish. And also, I was always interested in the interfaith also, in interfaith. And I, I do a lot of work in, in interfaith. And I was almost for, I, I think, 27 years doing a service in this. I never live it in the temple. Mm. I always live it in my own. I have my job. So I, I am also a Hatha yoga teacher. Even you can see me. I'm, I'm fat now, but uh, I used to be still like I, I teach. Um, so uh, part of my job also, I, I got a grant from the Spanish government to teach yoga in the prisons. So I was for four years teaching yoga in the prison. And it was also a way to not preach, but to, at least to share with the people who were there, the uh, image about uh, the philosophy, the basis of Krishna consciousness. And I used to tell them stories besides the yoga meditation, and they really like it. Um, I now, uh, well, in one sense, I was uh, 2012. I was not happy with the current situation of the, of the movement. I had also my own philosophical questions and doubts. After uh, being for many years, I was also the director of communication of ISCON Spain for a few years. Mm doing a lot of uh, uh, interviews and meetings with the government officials and being part of also of uh, religious, interreligious gatherings. And this is quite a summary of uh, yeah. uh, what I did. In a moment, I want to talk a bit about the Sri Vaishnav Sampradaya, but before we, we get on to that, um, can we just talk a bit about back to Chiru Swami Maharaj. So I, I think you were his, I think you were his first Spanish disciple. Yes, I was the first disciple and that was initiated by him. And he initiated me in Spain because then later on he initiated other Spanish in other countries or they went to India. And it was, uh, it was a fresh, fresh air for me in the sense that after what I saw, during Bhagavad times, uh, I was witness of many, uh, many, uh, let's say, anecdotes of uh, incidents. And now you you realize after almost uh, 40 years, uh, they are even funny, no? But those days, but since I was uh, a teenager and I hardly understood English in those days, so they allowed me to be in many uh, meetings because they say, okay, it's, they think it's a fool or it's not <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to grasp you know, whatever was going on. So after seeing that, um, and when Sharu Maharaj came to preach, actually he, 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 took, uh, he took over uh, France after uh, Bhagavan left, and Belgium and part of his former Zoom. So he tried to revitalize that area, and he also, with the help of other devotees, he said, a new Maya, he was ready to be uh, uh, took by the, by the French government due to so many debts and so many other uh, things. So it was nice. It was a perfect uh, Vajnava gentleman. He knew quite well about the etiquette. I learned a lot of things about the Vajnava etiquette. And how he treated his god brother in a very with a love of respect, because in one sense he was one of the he was the last sannyasi initiated by Sila Prabhupada personally in seventy seven, and he came late to his school. He, he joined in seventy six and he took initiation in Maya in seventy seven. Well, well, so well, I, I, yeah. Was back to Churu Swami? Was he given? Was he given diksha and sannyas on the same day? I probably well, had. actually, no, that, that information is, is not correct. He received it from Prabhupada, 
first and second initiation in Lord Purni, 77. And then in May, in uh, Snamiatra, the, the, in May 77, he was given to us, Srila Prabhupada in Vrindavan. But Srila Prabhupada was so sick that he couldn't uh, preside over the ceremony. And so they did the ceremony in the courtyard, the Krishna Madhavan courtyard. And three devotees, three Indian devotees, two sannyas. It was Bhaktichari Maharaj, another devotee was Bhakti Prema Swami, and then another one was Bhakti Chaitanya Swami, not the one from South Africa. From those three to left, he's gone later on. So he remained. And then after uh, they did the ceremony, they went to Srila Prabhupada's room, and Srila Prabhupada handed personally the danda. And there is a famous uh, conversation that uh, Prabhupada told him that now you are a sannyasi, now you can start giving initiation. But the etiquette is you wait till your guru is alive or present in the plan. So this is a message for those who follow the Rikrit philosophy <laughs> that uh, Sri Prabhupada personally told no? several to several devotees. So no, that uh, now you become a sannyasi, you can initiate. But this is not the etiquette. Hmm. And and when just remind me, when did Back to Churu Swami start initiating in which year? Yeah, he started initiating in 1987 in March. After they have the bid, uh, uh, like, the, like the concilium, like the concilium they have in 1987. Because I, I, I read a lot of books and essays and studies. So I'm kind of a historical person of, in the sense I like the story of his con. In 85, they had a big meeting in New Vrindavan. It was an unofficial meeting by the GBC. So in, in that, uh, in that uh, year, um, they allowed 20 more gurus, but you only need two recommendations. If you have two signs from two other gurus, you became a guru. But it was not official. But in those days, they made 20 gurus because the movement in 1985 was in a serious, uh, it was more to be broken because uh, many groups they wanted to, if they want to restrict their privileges and their worship and everything, they just was, uh, were threatening the men say, I will take all my disciples or the temples or whatever is in my zone, I will create another movement. So, after the pressure, they allowed 20 more gurus. So then in 1986, the GBC said that that uh, meeting was not properly done because they never invited all the officials and everything. So they, they uh, on, on that uh, year, they nominated 24, 25 gurus. They were the 20 from the previous <laughs> meeting in New Vrindavan, plus four or five. But they created a new law. They say that you have to be in ISKCON 10 years to become a guru. So in 1986, Bhakti Maharaj was only nine years in ISKCON. So he had to wait till 1987 to start giving Diksha in March, March of 87, yes. Okay. I was just trying to understand the context because I know you, that you are the first Spanish disciple of back yeah. to Chiru Swami. And I was wondering, are you one of the first overall as well? So at that point, Maharaj had been initiating for four years. Yeah. I'm just wondering when, how many disciples did he have before you? When I took the initiation, he had 300 disciples. Okay. But uh, at the last, maybe before he left the body, he had like five, 6,000. Yeah. So I was the first Spanish because he was mainly initiating in Bengal, West Bengal. So his, his first disciple were mostly Bengalis. And then he initiated some Italian devotees, some English devotees. Many of them took also re-initiation. Mm. So the disciple of Garaban, which I did that. So he gave a lot of re-initiation. But I was the first one in, in Spain. He gave me initiation to me and re-initiation to another devotee. 
that uh, that devotee for me was like a father. He was an, a mentor, a, a person I love from the very bottom of my heart. Unfortunately, he left the body a few years ago. That devotee uh, previously took the first initiation by Jayatirtha, then by Bhagavan, and then the third one by Gopichar. So he had a lot of faith <laughs> in the in the progress. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. Um, can we talk a bit about uh, your role as the ISCON Spain Communications Director? Uh, I think back in the 1990s uh, and maybe after. T tell us a bit about the role and, and what was involved. Yeah, what well, was involved? Well, we have a magazine that it was called uh, Mas Cerca. Mas Cerca means like uh, near to you or closer to you. It was an inside magazine. It used to be the director of the magazine. We collect the articles and everything. We have some original articles and interviews about Spain and some international interviews. We, we copy or replicate it from back to go and some other, some other source, sources. And then also I was like uh, presenting to the government, you know, recognition or if you want to do a meeting because on those days Iscon was in his own doing this interface. We were not united to other groups or to other Hindu groups because we have to recognize and I always say that Iscon is a Gauriya Vaishnava organization who is part of the broader uh, religion or way of life or culture or whatever you want to say is Sanatan Dharma or what we call nowadays Hinduism. Because sometimes when devotees preach, especially in the West, they say, no, because the Hindus or the Hindus do that, and we are not Hindus. But finally, academically, <laughs> um, historically, we are part of Sanatan Dharma. So we have to recognize that we have we are coming from a specific branch, the Guru Vaishnava, or as it is called Chaitanya Vaishnavism or Bengali Vaishnavism. And uh, Srila Prabhupada, this is what Srila Prabhupada brought to the West. Before, many years ago, we used to use no, like Krishna consciousness or the Hare Krishna movement, things like that. But nowadays, devotees are more integrated than we are in Guru Vaishnavas. I think it's the, it's the correct one because sometimes when they say Vedic, you know, in a sense, broad, you know, one thing is uh, Vedic is from many centuries ago and is part of the common root of the broader uh, Sanatana Dharma tradition, but we also have uh, scriptures that are part or are respected or only. Uh, recognized as authoritative by the Guru Vaishnavas. So this is in one sense, no? that, that slowly, slowly uh, devotees have to learn that if somebody asks you which, which religion you are, you cannot say Krishna consciousness. No? That you, you say Vaishnava is okay, but if you say Angoria Vaishnava is more specific. Because if you see or you compare the Vaishnavas from North India and South India is completely different in the way they dress and they talk, they eat, <laughs> they recite. So, yes, so I was trying to, you know, do alliance with other religions. We even uh, published a booklet about uh, interfaith and uh, ISKCON. Uh, I participated in the world religious uh, Parliament in 2004, it was held in Barcelona. Wow. Yeah, there was a, a group of, of the bodies that were, were there. And uh, being director means you always have to share the good things. And uh, of course, the good things, the positive things, and the official things. There is no voice for saying something against the authorities or you are not in favor of, you are not, you don't agree with this kind of a policy. It was, it was like that. 
then, uh, well, then till so I was doing that for for many years. Up, or you become popular. Um, unfortunately, you also create envy in the people. So sometimes when they call from different uh, TV programs or radio programs, or even from the government, they say we want to talk with Krishna Kri. So maybe the temple president or regional secretary say, oh, why they want to talk? He's nobody. He lives in the house. No? He's an outsider. No? <laughs> um, so this this happened. So finally, they took advantage of this thing. Uh, well, they kind of forced me to resign. So I... I uh, and then I uh, have like one the... I took a time to reflection, to reflect, to set my mind. And then I started, uh, for many years, I was kind of following the philosophy of the Shishta Dvaita. It was the main proper uh, philosophy uh, by the Paramuja Acharya, 12th, 12th century uh, guru, one of the, it actually is the oldest branch of Vaishnavism, Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya. And I, I got in contact with some other uh, Sri Vaishnavas, uh, Western and Indians as well. And finally, I took the Samasrayanam, who is the ritual, like kind of initiation, where they give you a mantra, a name, and the marks. They put the branded fire brand marks in the in the shoulder. Um, I'm really uh, quite happy now. Of course. Um, I have a lot of friends in this school. I, I am a Eastern Bolivian, nothing against that. Uh, they say that um, the greatest sin that you can atone in, that you can do prayaschita, even we have prayaschita, we have rituals to forgive or uh, obtain the atonement from many, many sins. Even if you kill a cow, you kill a Brahman, no, we hear from the scriptures. But there is no a ritual to obtain the atonement, the pardon, the forgiveness for being ungrateful. Okay? Kritagyan, Kritagyan in Sanskrit, grateful. That you know, you realize, you acknowledge what has been done to you. And Kritabhaga means the one who ignores what they did to you, good to you. So if you are ungrateful, uh, there is no way to correct that uh, offense or sin. So I don't want to be ungrateful. I'm really, really grateful to Srila Prabhupada and to his movement that he created, his teachings. But in one sense for me, I evolve. And for others, they will say in the other way. Maybe so I, I came down, I blub or... And they say this kind of jargon and they fell down. But I'm just a practicing Vaishnava, but some other rules. Um, for me, it's okay. I, I what I realize that everybody has, has to be happy in what they are practicing. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the ninth chapter, when they say that about Raja Vidya, this is the king of knowledge. And it has to be practiced with Susukam, with happiness. Or with utsahan, with enthusiasm. So if you are happy, if you are not happy at all, if chanting 16 rounds is a burden, or following the four rules and religion is a burden, and you can find another philosophy who is also Vaishnava, who also recognizes Krishna as the Supreme Lord, uh, in one sense we consider no? uh, in the Sri Vaishnavism, Krishna is a Purna avatar, is the full incarnation with all the power sense as Lord Narayan. But we don't have such uh, hard, uh, hard, um, hard rules like you have to chant 16 rounds. You have to chant one mantra, one round 108 times. If you have time, you can do more rounds. Otherwise, this is enough. Well, which one thing that is good for me is that we don't preach in the sense. We don't do proselytism. I suppose I travel a lot. I share a lot about uh, Vaishnavism, Sanatana Dharma, and everything. If anybody have a sincere desire to learn, of course, we 
attend him, we give the books, we give the direction. But we don't have to feel any kind of uh, conversion, conversions, a statistic or how many books we distributed or how many people became devotees, things like that. So for me, it's like I being relieved from a heavy burden that I have in my life for many, many years. So in one sense, I feel like a reset in my life. But I respect those who want to follow the teachings and the rules and religion from this point. Of all my appreciation and uh, good luck. Mm. Can you 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 mentioned a bit earlier on that you had some uh, differences of opinion with Iskon or some some philosophical differences with Iskon uh, that eventually led you to 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 join the Sri Vaishnav Sampradaya in twenty seventeen. Can you tell us a bit about those kind of philosophical differences, the things that you were disagreeing with Iskon on? Well, especially like, uh, as I said earlier, what I follow now is Vishista Dwaita. You know, Advaita is that in one sense, everybody is God, okay? And everybody have the power. Vishista Dwaita is a non-dual uh, qualified, Okay. means we are sent to Krishna, to God, in quality, but we are not sent in quantity. We are infinitesimal, smaller, and God is biggest of the being. No. But in quality, we are the same because we, we were made by him. He created us. Okay, so this is one reason because what is comprehensive is a chintya veda veda tata, one and separate, inconceivable. Okay, so and then also uh, I have some problem with the uh, divinity of uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Okay, what I consider him as a great saint, a uh, religious reformer. Uh, but not at, as an avatar or incarnation of Krishna. I always have my doubt, even if I used to worship Govardhanitari with uh, Radha Krishna alone, but even always I have my doubts because if you study also another Vaishnava Sampradayas, when they, uh, the reformer of the person who created that Sampradaya, uh, left the planet after some years, some decades, some centuries, they made him like an uh, avatar. You know? More than beyond, like for example, if you study the life of Ramanuja Acharya, several uh, centuries, they, they start claiming that he was an avatar of Anantashesh, you know, of Lord Badaran. If, if you study the life of Madhu Acharya, then they will say that he was a mixed avatar of Vayu, you know, and, uh, and another uh, Anuman, you know. So, or if, if we find also in the Gauri of Islamic tradition, like Chit Harivans, in Vrindavan, they say is the incarnation of Flute of Krishna, or Valavacharya, they call him also is a, is a incarnation of Krishna. So, the same happened with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. After some years, some decades, they were making like his uh, avatar. Mm. But of course, only Gauri Vaishnavas believe that. When you talk to other Sampradayas, they will say, oh, yes, we recognize he was a saint. He was a great reformer in the sense that he distributed the holy name. <laughs> Everybody without distinction, discrimination of you know race or caste and things like that. No? So I have that problem, and of course I respect um, very deeply those who believe that he's Krishna himself, because I, I'm not, I never have any interest of changing the mind of mm -hmm. anybody of their belief. I think that uh, we should have a freedom of belief also within the Vaishnava Sampradayas. For example, in the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, they told you 
if you want to consider Ramanuja Acharya as the greatest saint and the founder, the propounder of the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, even he has a, he's a master, he's not like Yamanuja Yaman, Yaman Acharya and everything. But you don't have to believe that he is an incarnation of an Antashesh. This is up to you. You want to believe in his divinity or you want to believe and respect him as a great teacher, one of the greatest teachers that India uh, has given to the world. So this is one thing. And then, of course, it can, when you read, start reading so many other books about Sanatan Dharma from other authors, the interpretations of the books about the philosophy, the spine, I, I can see the narrow, narrow find that finally, like, we are like the chosen people by God, and the rest of the universe is uh, mistaken. And uh, so it was kind of opening over in my eyes. Mm. Well, this is a, it was like, a search after after being for so many years in a in Niscom and with a very deep uh, I grasped the philosophy very deep and everything, but then I realized having the opportunity of travel to India many times, meeting many different uh, teachers, uh, reading uh, many books, hearing from so many people. Even my father, I remember, my father, we used to disagree. You know, when I used to say that Krishna is the supreme personality in your head, he said, no, no, we will. We were always uh, taught that uh, Krishna is coming from Narayan. Narayan is the source of all the avatars. Krishna is the most important. So we used to disagree things, things like that. And, and now you realize one, um, one the Vaishnava, actually Vaishnava teacher, told me in a very, very simple way and just uh, showing we were audience. I, I don't, I don't, it's not my intention to respect anybody and trying to uh, hurt the feelings of anybody, but when Sri Vaishnava asked me, what is the meaning of Ram Navami? Say, is the appearance day of Lord Ramachan? I said, yes. What is Narasimha Hachatardasi? I said, is the appearance of Lord Narasimha? Yes. What about Sri Krishna Jamashtam? The appearance day of Lord to Krishna. So he was mentioning and say, uh, when is the appearance day of Lord Vishnu? I say, there is no appearance day of Lord Vishnu. He say, yes, you got it now, because he's the source of all the avatars. And then the different levels of avatar, they told me, and it's clearly mentioned by the scripture, that the Krishna is purna avatar, means full avatar, is equal, have the same power, the same energy, the same attributes as Lord Narayan. But in Sri Vaishnavimu, we recognize that the origin of Lord Krishna is Lord Narayan. And there is no difference between them. Gorya Vaishnavism says that Krishna is Avatari. He is the source of the different incarnation. So things like that. Was it, was it easy for you to make that change from Gaudiya Vaishnavism to the Sri Vaishnav Sampradaya. Was it was it an easy transition or was it a bit of a struggle? Well, it was, a, uh, of course, it's a bit of a struggle because like many scriptures uh, of uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism are in Bengali. And, but so in, in Sri Vaishnavism are in Tamil, a language that I'm not familiar. I can't speak Hindi. I can understand Hindi, but who is coming from Sanskrit, but uh, Tamil uh, is, is a really difficult language. I can grasp a few words, few sentences. By the time, the environment is morally and more, more or less based in South India, in Tamil. Sri Vaishnavism is known in the West as South Indian Vaishnavism. No? Mm. So it was a kind of difficult, even with the food and everything. So I'm trying to adjust in a way that I also I don't want to be too technical or I don't want to have an approach of being too South Indian. I try to be as normal as possible for me and try to integrate the practices. No. Like uh, when you have the interview with uh, I remember Chandra Shekhar who is my brother <laughs> about the dress code and everything. So well, I wear, of course, when I, I'm going to do a 
fire ceremony, or I have to represent the uh, Sanatan Dharma, I will dress maybe in a dopey and a and everything, but in my normal day, daily life, I wear shirt and pants and everything. So, so I slowly, slowly, it's, still is a process <clears throat> of learning uh, about Sri Vaishnavism. I don't reject uh, all what I learned from uh, Gore Vaishnava. But of course, I have to move forward. The, the, one of the reasons that I took the Samastraya was because uh, the teachers told me that you can have different teachers for different subjects. Okay? So from Gore Vaishnavism, you took initiation from Patricia as well. There is no need to change that. He was perfect doing that. Teacher Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada, if you want to learn another subject, because it's Sri Vaishnava Samantha, you can take another teacher. Like we have in life different teachers for different subjects, for music, or for you know, for law, for mathematics, and everything. So I think you have to be open and try to integrate what is best in your life for because finally I can see spiritual life is a it's a travel that we have to do alone. Finally, you are alone. Mm -hmm. If you are in a Sangha, or you are in the, with so many people, finally, your daily life, you have to do it, it alone. So you have to be fit. Um, you have to feel comfortable. You have to be happy. You have to be with enthusiasm. Nothing had to be done by force or in pause. And for me, and I confess, for many, many years, Chanting 16 rounds was a kind of burden for me. It was an struggling. I was more concentrated in the numbers and to complete that quota that I, I promised to follow rather than in the nectar of the holy name or religion. So now I'm relieved from that in one sense. So I'm trying to adjust my spiritual life in a way that I'm happy what I'm doing. I don't feel a uh, burden or somebody is imposing anything on me. And we try to follow as much as possible. And I'm vegetarian for the last 40 years. I don't take any toxic as Maybe sometimes I have a tea, or even a coffee, because in Sri Vaishnava, we don't have probably tea or coffee. And this is what uh, I do in my daily life, which I'm the guy with the Sandhya Vandana. It's a more complete form of doing the Gaitri mantras, uh, which are the mantra of Namor Kayanaya. We read the scriptures, and, and that's all. Mm. Be happy. <laughs> I, I liked what you said. You, 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 explained, you explained it very well in terms of, you know, um, taking teachings, taking, taking information and knowledge from different religious traditions that Bhakti Churu Swami initiated you into Gaudiya Vaishnav, into the Gaudiya Vaishnav Sampradaya or tradition. And then, you know, someone else initiated in, you into the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya. And there, and, and I like, I liked how you explained that is that they're both true or they're both important for you, you know, and, uh, my background is in, uh, Methodist Christianity. So Methodist Methodism is a is a nonconformist offshoot of the Church of England. And I haven't rejected my Methodism or my Methodist Christianity. Um, the founder of Methodism was a man called John Wesley, who lived in the late 1700s. And I was actually listening to some of his teachings yesterday and I felt very emotional listening to his teachings about loving God, loving people around us. And for me, that wasn't a contradiction to what Pearl had taught. They are teaching the same thing, just in a, in a different way. So yeah, I, I kind of like the way you, you explain that. Um, so let's move on a bit now to uh, your interfaith work. Uh, so you're you're very busy. You're very active. Uh, I can see that on social media. Um, <laughs> it's social media, Facebook's great, isn't it? Because you feel like you know somebody really well, and actually you don't. <laughs> but you see all these uh, photos on Facebook. Um, and I, I believe at the moment you're the president of the Hindu Federation of Spain. 
uh, which sounds very important. And you're also the vice president of the Hindu Federation of Europe. Yeah, yeah. Both of the, those positions in Spain and the president since he was founded in 2015, trying to have a voice to be the representative uh, with the central government of all the different branches, uh, path of some Pradayas of Sanatan Dharma. And we have uh, many different groups. We have people advocating so-called uh, Maya Valis in Islam. That I don't like to uh, uh, that derogatory name anymore. Maya Valis or Karmis. I hate that word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate the word Karmi. I agree on that yeah. one. It's it's quite a yeah. derogatory term, definitely. Yeah. So we have Advaitis and we have Vaishnavas and we have Shaivas and all different groups. Because when we are together under the umbrella of the federation, we're trying to uh, get the best uh, from the government concessions and whatever is possible to be recognized, officially recognized. And it's, it's uh, uh, quite interesting that having a variety of so many groups, ISCOM is not part of the Hindu Federation of Spain. And, and some people, they say, because I am the president, so. Uh, they're waiting, maybe they remove me or I resign to, to be part of that. Also, uh, well, they have some kind of, because every organization has only one board. That means even if you have five branches in Spain, you have one board because you are the same organization. So we try that no, no, no any organization can control the federation federation have to be neutral and have to have a voice for all the different uh some pradayas and different uh, uh we say lineages etc so they have seven temples in spain so they wanted seven bots and you imagine no if we are 15 or something like that and you have seven bots from the same organizations it's impossible to run the, the federation in an independent way. So they don't accept that. But we have other Gaudiya Vaishnava people. We have disciples of Sri Maharaj, Narayana, different Vishnu Maharaj. Different well, that's people. good. That's good. Disciples of Puri Maharaj. Well, that's the, the Sri Gopinath Gaudiya Mat. Uh, yeah. That's they encouraging. Have, yeah. Disciples yeah. of <laughs> Um so this is one thing Then the Hindu Federation of Spain they also is part of the Hindu Forum of Europe, also is another umbrella organization. Uh, they have, we have our headquarters in Brussels, the heart of the European Union. And presently we have a, a federation of 16 countries, including the UK, who, who is not part of the European Union, but still we consider that a part of the European continent. Otherwise, there is about uh, 3 million uh, Hindus uh, living in Europe. When we say Hindus, it means people who practice any form of Hinduism. doesn't mean who have to be ethnically linked to with India or have Indian sex. So those who practice any form of Sanatan Dharma, almost 3 million. So almost 1 million is in the UK. So we didn't want to uh, lose that part, no? so so now and the vice president was elected in 2022. Uh, we have a three years office on the election, and we have a very good thing that we celebrate uh, Diwali, the Fe festival of lights in the European Parliament. Every year we started in 2015, so every year, except during the pandemic, we celebrate Diwali. And we invite. Uh, dignitaries and the president of the European Parliament, ambassadors of India and Nepal, many, many people come. It's, it's a nice job. And we give talk, we give the magazine, we have also cultural presentation. And <clears throat> also, this used to come, but now they're not coming for the last two years, something like that. The, also... This is to the, to the meeting in Brussels, they don't come anymore. Yeah, we have also some kind of problem. With the with them uh, in the uh, at the European level, uh, we used to have a uh, ISCON of Italy, uh, ISCON of uh, uh, Belgium, 
uh, Hungary and everything. So we have some problem, maybe with one federation, but three or four of them, they they resign from the, from the organization. It's quite sad because if we get some benefit or we get some recognition, it will benefit all the organization. But yeah, it, it is it is very sad. What why are they not involved in what's happening with Brussels? Yeah, well, because they want to do things their way. Mm. And you can do always in your way because when you are part of an umbrella organization, you have to respect the other views. I can tell you. Just, uh, we're just, we seem to have lost. Okay, now uh, it was, I, yeah, yeah, it's I'm okay. I, you're, you're back now. You're back now. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> you, you, you were just, yeah. And so Iskon, uh, I think you were saying Iskon wants to do their own thing. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, in the sense we publish a magazine, a yearly magazine, and they want to, uh, include all the articles written by his colleagues. Mm. So what happened with other scholars and other people who also have a voice and they are from different traditions. No? Or... Is, it, is it also because uh, Iskon doesn't want to be seen as Hindu? Is that another reason, possibly? Well, they, they use uh, two kind of hats, you know, like when they need something or they want to be in public, they put them. We are Hindus. Then in private, uh, when they give classes or meetings, they say we are not Hindus. And they go, oh, the Hindus came to the temple. Oh, we need the funds from the Hindus. And we have to collect <laughs> so much money from the Hindus. But we are not Hindus. So we're coming from a different galaxy, you know. And what are you wearing? A dot is uh, coming from India. No? <laughs> How you eat? Things like that. So even in Italy, they have the Hindu Federation of Italy, and ISCON is not part of that. So they created their own organization, which is not recognized by the Italian government. The same happened in different different places. Or they created a federation in Hungary when only ISCON is the only entity. And there is no other uh, association. How can it, how is possible you can create a federation with only one entity? Federation means you put together different different organizations, things like that. So finally, <clears throat> things the board uh, of, of director we don't agree with all these policies and everything. So so they left and they, they say mm -hmm. that maybe we will create an in the Federation of Europe or something like that, or Eastern mm -hmm. Federation of Europe, but. Uh, you know, I can tell you, and as you were asking me, and this is related to interface. I'm doing interface since 1999, means more than 25 years. And at, at the beginning, I never realized. But now that I am part of different uh, organizations, international organizations, like IC, who is an international organization, by Center, who is a... Um, one of the most important international uh, interfaith uh, and interreligious uh, organization in the world is uh, is uh, managed by uh, three countries: uh, Spain, Austria, and Saudi Arabia, and is part as a partner uh, the Vatican, okay, the Holy Site. Um, so we get the training to become experts in the. Uh, interreligious dialogue and intercultural as well as also to solve problems between religions. For example, is there is some problems of uh, uh, Christians with the Muslim or Muslim with, uh, with Jewish or whatever, so you can go there and try to talk to have an agreement, to give some peace, things like that. And I am part of that. I graduated in, in Lisbon. I did my training for two years. Then I'm part also of uh, another interreligious organization from the University of Coimbra in Portugal. I am part of another organization, a founder of Transcendence, which is a very important international organization, was based in Spain. 
And all of them, they always, the first question they ask me, are you ISCO? Are you part of ISCO? So I say, no, no, no. <laughs> because I, they always have kind of feeling that no, everything is clear. No, everything, which, uh, why are you coming here? So I remember when I was taught about the ISCO communications course, that sometimes if you're going to interface also, it's not because you want to learn from other traditions. It's that you have to go there to present the real philosophy and uh, try to convince them that we are right. And now I realize so many years that when I go to interface is to share my belief, to learn from others, try to apply in my life also, the good things or the things that I can uh, assimilate from other traditions. And we have a common uh, goal that is to help humanity, the humankind, to have a more peaceful life. I published a book uh, about nature and spirituality, and I put together the views of the cosmovision of uh, nine different religions. And it was very well accepted. And it was financed by KC, that book. So, like, I am really involved, but with a, in good faith. Uh, the, my respect with for all the religions, even I don't agree with all of them. The scholars say that we have 63% things in common and only 37% we have differences. There are some theological things that will never come to an agreement. We are to respect that. At the same time, we should cooperate for the environment, for you know the resources, for the human being, for the freedom of speech. We have to be active against the hate speech. So many things like that. And we waste a lot of time fighting among them. So, Quite. Oh, there we go. Like, like for myself, being accepting another tradition within the Vaishnavism, when Srila Prabhupada recognized the four Vaishnava Sampradayas in all his book, you can see how he mentioned the four Vaishnava Sampradayas. So he has said that they are one of five. You can be in any of them. And when I Became, I, I never joined any organization. I'm not part of any Sri Vaishnava organization. I just have my teachers, my gurus, and who are uh, quite old. They live in India. Um, I'm not doing any after preaching. Whoever wants to take the Samasharayana, we also give the ceremony to them. But when I took a, a initiation, I make it published because some of my friends have to keep it secret because they have some connection, they will do the same services in, in ISCOM, not in Spain, in other countries, so they have to keep it secret. They have to be inside the closet. But I did openly, and I published the picture, and many devotees stopped talking to me. And they rejected me, and uh, it was kind of sad, because we shared so many years mm. of French experience and everything, and suddenly... Can you imagine if they say, oh, Krishna Kripa now is taking drugs or he becomes a drunk or, you know, so many things and they will be more happy than the uh, initiation or shelter in another center. And it, it's sad that the, they, they have the courage, um, they have the strength or the faith to sit with a Muslim or with a Christian, with a Jewish, with a Buddhist to talk, but they don't want to sit with other Vaishnavas and talk. What is wrong? What is good? Or we can improve? Or we can cooperate? I do most of the cooperation that I do in Spain are with the Advaitins organization, with my abadis, and they do a lot of cooperation. I I agree. I I think pretty much 95, 99 percent of what you've been saying. Uh, one of the things that makes me incredibly sad is that uh, yeah, I'm going to pick on Iscon for a little bit. Uh, the leadership of ISKCON or, or some devotees in ISKCON will talk to Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and Jews, uh, 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 Mormons, uh, Scientologists, but they will not talk to devotees from other Gaudiya Vaishnav groups. So 
not just other Vaishnav groups, other Gaudiya Vaishnav groups that we must have 99% in common with, the disciples of Narayan Maharaj or Sridhar Maharaj or Puri Maharaj. Um, there is this fear or this uh, uncertainty about talking to the other side. And actually, we follow the same diet. We chant the same mantra in the Gaudiya Vaishnav tradition. Uh, we do deity worship. We might wear the same clothes. We have the same philosophy. We give the same uh, reverence to Titania Mahaprabhu. Yeah. And I just find it so bizarre still that uh, some people in Iskon, not all, will have this very fanatical sectarian view, you know. And so I, I, I come from an interfaith background. Um, I discovered Gaudiya Vaishnavism through my degree in comparative religion. So I, I come at it from the same angle as, as you do. I would rather focus on the things we have in common uh, rather than the things that divide us. Uh, you know, my view on ISKCON, uh, certainly in the UK, and I'm not sure about the rest of Europe, is ISKCON in the UK has nothing to worry about. It has a lot of property, a lot of members, a lot of money. If the disciples of Naraya Maharaj, for example, want to open another temple in London, I don't think they do, but if they want to, fine. There's 8 million people in London. Why are you worried? Even if 1 million people went to Bhaktivedanta Manor, 7 million people still don't. So why don't we work together <laughs> to share, yeah. well, to share religiosity. You know, I don't mind if people become Sikhs or Christians, have a relationship with God. And actually Prabhupada said something very similar. He said, if you're, if you're a Christian, then read the Bible. If you're a Muslim, read the Quran, do something to be God conscious. Uh, so I, I think 99%, you and I are pretty much cut from the same cloth. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to, to understand you know, the animosity about uh, towards the older Gaudiya Vaishnava yeah. organization. Because finally, Prabhupada himself was a member of the Gaudiya Path. No? And, and, yeah. you know, and if you see, I, I don't know if you are aware of that, but uh, mm, Sridhar Maharaj who was he was the one who gave sannyas to uh Srila Prabhupada Sanyas Guru, but Pragyan Keshava Maharaj. So so after Prabhupada received from Bhakti Pragyan Keshava Maharaj, who received it from Sridhar Maharaj. Because Prabhupada asked Sridhar Maharaj, but they were too close. They were very friends. They said, I don't want to give you sannyas and then all relationship or friendship will change. So he approached uh, Keshava Maharaj, and then Prabhupada gave it sannyas to Iskon devotees. So all the sannyasis in Iskon, their mantra is coming from Sridhar Maharaj, in one sense. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> the, the link, the links are the links are endless. I mean, you're absolutely one hundred percent spot on. I mean, I was also thinking that uh, so the Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti. Uh, which was founded in 1953, Srila Prabhupada was one of the founders of the Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti. He was one of the founding trustees. Um, another thing that a lot of devotees in ISKCON don't know is that uh, one of the first distributors, or even the, so after Prabhupada, the first distributor of the Back to Godhead magazine was uh, Govinda Maharaj, the successor to Srida Maharaj. Yeah. Uh, so there's all these wonderful links between the God Brothers and, uh, you know, uh, disciples that are very rich and very beautiful. Uh, and 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 I've, yeah. Any and so there's so many wonderful links. And I, I remember seeing. I think you were in the UK last summer, possibly. Yeah. And I remember seeing the photos on your Facebook and I tell you why I remember it is because you were on, you were at an interfaith conference and you had a picture with lots of people 
And one of the things that made the pictures, I remember it, is because I think one of the people, you, you mentioned on the photo who was in the photo. And one of the people in the photo was from the Church of Scientology. Yeah. yeah. And I, I remember that because the Church of Scientology gets so much criticism. <laughs> yeah. But I was just fascinated that you had met somebody from the Church of Scientology. You were kind of reaching out. And I, I, I have very good relationship with them, even with the director of uh, European Affairs, who is a Spanish guy. And I have very good relationship. And they invite me even to give talks in their own centers. They have a very famous center in Spain. And they invite me to give a talk and they don't have any problem. But the people uh, accuse them of being a cult or whatever. I don't... Uh, interfere or whatever the policy of the belief I respect uh, uh, but they invite me but it's, it's impossible that somebody else come from outside to give a talk in ISCON no? <laughs> so they invite me and, and I don't have any problem I do a lot of ceremonies from, from people who are from the Sparta Sampradaya, people mm. who are Shaivas and they invite me and do the ceremonies and I'm trying to have a respect. I was last year in the Vatican. Wow. In the first first Hindu Hindu Christian European meeting official. We were for two days in the Vatican, invited by the Vatican. Um, we were with the means the division, they call the dicastery of interfaith dialogue. And uh, they have a specific branch within the Vatican to deal with the uh, uh, non-Abrahamic religions, okay? So we have an official meeting for today. Then we have a, a meeting with the Pope in the in the cathedral of St. Peter. Um, it was fantastic. And, and can you imagine? We were uh, like 40 representatives of different European countries. And there were only two people from ISCOM. And another, they wanted to come more, so the the Vatican say no. We want to be as uh, plural as possible, have a lot of diversity, and they complain and they blame me and Hindu Forum of Europe that we were blocking their entry in that meeting. So we have one one devotee from the UK and one devotee from Hungary. They are coming, so we don't need uh, twenty people from ISCOM. No, we are from different different branches. I was quite nice and see those who were in, in dial, uh, creating the dialogue or the debate in some places were Indian Christians. The bishop and the priest and the cardinal all were Indians who converted to Christianity. Mm. And nobody had a problem with that. No? So sometimes we can see uh, that especially in the West, in the West, they are becoming more open mind, especially in the USA. But uh, in India, ISCON is becoming too fundamentalist in one sense, according to my view. And living, uh, I lived there for, for six years. And of course, half of my blood is, is Indian. So in one sense, I understand. What, but I can see now becoming more. Before you were a Westerner, I looked as a Westerner. And you used to go to this contemple and they were, they were crazy about you. They were very happy. And nowadays you go there, maybe they don't pay any attention to you because <laughs> they are concentrated in their own thing. Like East Kong India is another world in one sense. And when some policies, uh, they don't suit them, like the female Diksha Guru, they always treat in the rest of his, oh, we're going to separate. If you allow a woman to give this, I will set up. So now the only place that is going is increasing and becoming more popular, having an impact in the society is in India. So they don't they don't want to, in one sense, lose that link. And Sheila Prabhupada, after 1971, he did a lot of effort to preach in India mm. to create these centers. Mm. And he said that the, all the Western devotees should go to India. Uh, not to live, but to learn, to uh, take advantage of the spiritual atmosphere of the dham, and then came back to the West. Even Bhaktisharu Maharaj told me once that he said, Shila Prabhupada will come now 
to Iskon in the West, he will be very disappointed when he will enter in the temples and see only Indian congregation uh, members. Because Prabhupada wanted that the local people join the temples. Why is the Prabhupada say we open a temple in Amsterdam or Paris or in Spain? We want the local people to join. Of course, everybody is welcome. But if you go nowadays to back to Dantamano, Amsterdam temple, Paris temple, so many uh, temples, most of the people or the devotees are imported from India or some of them are local uh, immigrants who are coming to the temple. In one sense, it's okay because Prabhupada's intention was that the temple are a kind of embassies of India to them, of the culture, the spirituality. But in one sense, uh, it's going to be failing to attract a new generation, a new wave of Western people to the temple. Very, very few people are, are joining. In Spain, not many Indians are joining, but a lot of people are coming maybe from East Europe or Latin America, but very few Spanish people are coming. And they, they, this was not the uh, intention of, of Sina Prabhupada, no? He created an international organization. So we can see now that there is becoming more fundamentalism in so many issues in India that we can see, okay, according to time, place, and circumstances, it's okay. Like before, we used to have female pujaris all over the world. Now, for many years in India, only men are in the altar. And they say, no, we have to follow uh, local culture. Mm. But Just before we finish, can I ask you a, a question or a few questions about your, your, your seva or your work as a Hindu priest? So I, th yeah. I think you are a Hindu priest. Uh, so yeah. tell, tell us a bit about that. What, uh, what's involved? What do you do? Yeah, tell us a bit about your, your role as a okay. Hindu priest. So technically, it's called a purohita. Purohita means the one who the, performed or officiated the samskaras, mm. right, of passages or sacraments of Hinduism or Sanatan Dharma. So I, um, I travel all over Spain, office on several other European countries to do ceremonies like the Nama Karana Samskar, means the then giving ceremony that we do for children, for newborn children. But also we give the name also to people who become Hindus in any particular branch okay there is no need to go to an initiation to receive a hindu name so the first sacrament that we give to a person who come back to sanatan dharma because we don't have a right of conversion but we have a we call it as a right of coming back to sanatan dharma you always belong to what is eternal sanatana but now we are welcoming you in an official way so we do the namakarana ceremony when a person let's say Peter wants to become a Hindu in a serious way. So we don't ask them for a few things. Uh, we don't have full rules and regulations. We try to, and we give a name, a Hindu name, according to the astrology or whatever the, what it is. It's uh, his or her Ishtadevata. Then uh, I do also a lot of weddings. Uh, Hindu weddings in Spain. Uh, Spain is be, be, becomes a, is nowadays a wedding venue or wedding destination for the how you mentioned earlier at the beginning for the good weather, warm weather. So many people I I, I do the ceremonies for many people from the UK, from the United Kingdom, and they're coming uh, to avoid the rain and the clouds and everything. So. I marry a lot of people from London, from Leicester, from Liverpool, many places. Also from the from Australia, from the USA. Of course, also local people. So I do the marriage ceremony for Indian Hindus as well as Western Hindus. Or even sometimes there is a mixed marriage. Like, for example, the bride is Christian and the groom is Hindu or vice versa. So I do these ceremonies. And of course, the sad part also, I do the, uh, the cremation ceremonies. Sometimes they call me. Uh, so I attend the, I do the, the ceremony, then we take the body to the cremation parlor. And, uh, 
then I try to advise the people, the family, things like counseling, no, to the those who it's not like uh, it's gone her way, no. That when somebody died, oh, we are not this body, don't worry about that. Oh, it was your mother, but it was your mother in this life, so don't worry about that. No, I try to be more hard as closer and try to, <laughs> uh, you know, um, give relief to the person. No? That okay, we are not this body, but at the same time, you have to sympathize with the, with the pain of those people. No? So things like, like that, and well, this is part of my my service to the to the communities. To the Indian community, to all the Hindus who come to Spain. I'm always learning, reading, reading about the history of ISKCON is also is an interesting topic. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. It's a fascinating topic that yeah, still, always, still fascinates me. Yeah, advice. I, I, I always I suggest to people to read two books. One of them is The Betrayal of the Spirit by Nori Muster. Nandini, who was also a director of communication in LA during the Sonalacharya days. And it's a very, very nice book. And another one is the from an author that you interviewed uh, not long ago, Henry Dostoyevsky, The 11 Naked Gurus. This is also a, a nice book because even some of the stories I, I saw firsthand. So it's, it's nice, yes. And of course, I, I, I read many books by disciples of Srila Prabhupada that they told their own memoirs. Because if you read several books, you can see how different views. Hmm. And even nowadays, some when somebody wrote something about that particular incident, the other guy say, no, no, I was there, it was not like that. He just misinterpreting. In any case, we can see the problems and the eagles and uh, fighting was there also, was present also in Shila Prabhupada times, physical presence, but he always know how to solve the problems. And he always uh, tried to give importance to each individual. And he, he, he Shila Prabhupada has uh, always service for everybody, for each individual. He never rejects anybody basing any uh, background or ethnic or things or things like that mm. and this is what we are missing now that uh, I don't know <laughs> mm. believe it or not uh, Prabhu Prabhuji we've been chatting for almost an hour and a half uh, on, on this recording and I, I knew that we would have a lot to chat about uh it's uh it's been it's been great to finally meet you in this way uh we've been friends on facebook for quite a while yeah. and uh i'm pleased that you've um finally agreed to be a guest on the podcast uh um as you know i like to interview a variety of people and i i feel like because sometimes I wonder who listens to these podcasts or who's who's interested in anything that we do. And and I feel very humbled, actually, that you've mentioned two previous guests. And when I think about those guests and I think about, you know, how much I respect them and the books that they've written, I think, wow, we're really achieving something with this podcast. Um, and I'm pleased to add your name now to the list of guests. Uh <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry it's taken three years uh, I, I don't know if there's anything auspicious about the number 122 <laughs> it's, it's really nice that uh, you are having so, so many programs because it's, uh, the program is successful and the people like it because I think that everybody wants to hear different views different uh, approach, different experience what the people uh, related to their life experience with this mine is I can tell you true more, more sweet than than sour and I wish I am well wish this and his followers but we have to agree that with time few things have to be adjusted changes like the Catholic Church and every other 
mainstream big religions have changed it. Even the if you see such uh, ancient and traditional uh, sampradaya like the matva sampradaya, uh, for centuries they always uh, restrain from traveling overseas because crossing overseas for them were losing their caste and losing their sannyas vows. And now they allow uh, some sannyasis are traveling to the West. Even mm. Sri Vaishnavas, they are traveling to the West, some sannyasis. So they are adjusting with times and with the necessity, the needs of the people. So it's going to be also should do that. And they always criticize other Gorya group because they don't put uh, so much emphasis in chanting uh, the Japa. They don't uh, put the goal of the vow of 16 rounds. Like Shilder Maharaj used to ask for four rounds. Some people say, okay, you chant as much as you can. So things like that have to be adjusted. That's the mean that you are doing, giving a big concession or you become less pure. But if you want to increase numbers and you want to reach more people, and now most of the people live outside the temples. Everybody have their jobs, their life. You cannot uh, force them, in one sense, to have such a um, strained or such an endeavor to chant their own. Mm. It's not like the Brahmachari who woke up four o'clock in the morning. But if you have a daily life, it is difficult. Mm. And this is, is is my opinion, of course. It's, some people have it. Even the other day, I saw one in the in the Instagram. I saw one uh, Indian uh, girl who was following ISKCON uh, and doing videos, a lot of very good preaching. And finally, I saw her with a different pillar, Gorya Vaishnava, but it was not the ISKCON standard. And I wrote to her, and she said, "Finally, I have to take initiation in another Gorya Vaishnava Sampradaya." Because this con was giving me so many rules, so many rules, so many things. And I saw that also my role as a woman was uh, not uh, mm. very clear. It wasn't like a second city, second citizen, no? um, second class citizen. So finally, she took a decision. So, so you Prabhu. It's been great to have you as the guest this week. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that we managed to find a day and a time that worked for us both. Um, so a huge thank you to Krishna Kripa Prabhu uh, for being the 122nd guest uh, on the Harry Krishna Project podcast. Uh, so Krishna Kripa, I'm just going to say goodbye to people watching at home uh, and then you and I can have a brief debrief after. Uh, so a big thank you to Krishna Kripa Prabhu for being the guest this week. Um, do not forget if you're watching this podcast on YouTube to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Uh, and also if you're watching this on Facebook to like or follow the Harry Krishna Project Facebook page. Those are the two ways you can watch the podcast. Uh, and we would love for you to follow us or subscribe so you can see future podcasts uh, and find out what we're doing here at the Harry Krishna Project. Also, we love to receive feedback. We love to receive constructive feedback. You are allowed to disagree with a guest and you are allowed to disagree with me, uh, but please do it in a constructive way. Uh, I am, I am, and I know Krishna Kri Prabhu is as well. We are, we love open dialogue. We love people, we love to meet people that might disagree with us so we can see, we can have a conversation and see where we can meet in the middle um so do not forget to send your constructive feedback you can do that via uh, youtube facebook or via our website uh, the harry krishna project.org.uk uh so until next week uh we'll see you all soon thank you harry krishna thank you sir.